podium. Okay, quick thesis. Think about that Y, think about the A, B, and C that you can write together, or you could write an essay about. I might not choose. And I can tell time and make eyes. When you're done, go back, look at the why. You'll make sure that that's something that ties everything together. There's a lot of things that that's kind of like an underlying principle. A new era, a new attitude that people have. In A, B, and C, you could write three good paragraphs about it. Yeah, but I instruction. Okay, you should be just finishing up. A, B, and C, it's just basically short IDs. You just need a topic sentence, unlike a short ID or a short answer question. Couple examples, why it's important, that relates back to the thesis, essentially why. All right, we should be, are you about finishing up? Last words? All right, let's go to exchange. Exchange with your neighbor, look at thirds, go through it, read it, see if you can identify their why, you can identify their A, B, and C. Why you do that? Back to the room. So seeking it out by the why, Dr. Jagan, justify it. My swagger sick. Your participation exchange. Good. Can you see the why? Can you see what they were tied together? If you read their thesis, you know, you know where they're going. You know what to expect. And that's the big element of thesis. You're telling the reader, the assessor, where you're going with this. It's good. The only the only thing I want to say is it's fascinating to actually press this. Other than that, I said good organization. If you decide to get the organization, good. Yeah, the problem you're really close, you start reading really something. Did anybody read one that was so good you want to volunteer your neighbor to read one? So good. Hey, Jazzy, volunteer to read hers. Go ahead. I'm not to me. I don't read it. Well, thank you. I want to hear it. Why this can be not very funny. That's OK. OK. Many European countries created World War I due to previous alliance with imperialism and many fun that. Yeah, you read that much for why. Yeah. But the, the blueprint is good, so the ABC is good. 
Now we're going to set the titles together. So it could be nationalist, it could be industrialization, modern states, arms race, something like that. But other than that, that's good. Anybody else want to read theirs? Go ahead. Did the last part? There was an increase in there we go. Good together, good organization. A couple were kind of close about arms, about weapons. But other than that, that was good. Only thing you want to make sure it was a little separation between the A, B, and C because you don't want to repeat. Which is always an issue that I guarantee every single one of us in here is ever in the last day you start, you know, you go back and repeat yourself. But that was good. One more? Anybody? I know, but I. I like how you volunteer other people. That's good. Very good blueprint. Same though, not much of a why. You have nothing to say the factors are all because of nationalism or the arms race or industrialization or something. Something to tie together. But just need something to kind of tie that together. Other than that, that's good. Now, you can have a good blueprint. And that's still not a bad thesis. It's just not quite strong enough. And one thing about having that why is showing that you've thought it through and you have something to tie the whole essay together, you know, to kind of wrap it together. And it could be something as simple as just the alliance system or just modernization or new kinds of states, new economic system. It doesn't need to be, be great at you know, the perfect tie together, but something to tie it together that you can kind of focus in. You want to see mine? It's beautiful. It has red lettering. I wrote it real quick. I wrote it so fast I can't find. Oops. Everything's tied together with nationalism. I thought that was the one thing you can kind of put everything together. No. And basic thesis statement. And so my first paragraph of my body would be a topic sentence about the arms race, explain it, give an example like mobilization, artillery, dreadnoughts, and say that the, uh, the countries began to build arms these, uh, and rivalries, they formed alliances um, to protect their national interests, that's how to the nationals. And that's it. And that's really all an essay is. You have a good thesis statement. The only thing, and we'll work more on this context, and I'll help you out more of that down the road. So let's jump right back in with the war. Get it? See? Jump? See? Knows that? Yeah. Like that? So I thought about watching the Killing Fields, the video I have. It's amazing. You will, you will appreciate it. <clears throat> but I, I want to get through this. We have to get to 1914 before it makes sense. So we'll do, we'll watch it next week. It's, gosh, one of the best things I have. The show on World War One. In fact, this unit would have two of the best videos I have. This one and then one on the 1920s. They're just they're so great for similar reasons. So let's get to more. We talked about why did the UK? Wow, the sun is out. It's going to be. It's going to be in the 90s soon. You know the best part about spring coming. The, the hollow one. <laughs> That's the best part. It's when the trees big That's my favorite part. Looking out and falling in the trees. Who's with who? Don't you enjoy that? It's like the first sign of spring. The hollow. Some people say robins. I say hollow ones. I'm old fashioned. All right. So the UK entered the war, making it a world war because who was attacked? The UK, England, yeah, Belgium. And what was the plan to sweep through the German plan? <laughs> yeah, Sweetland, I know. And well, who was assassinated? Who did the assassination? Yeah, the black hand. What was the guy? Prince C. What country was behind it? <laughs> yeah, so that whole thing happened. Oh, what single person more than any other person? 
is probably responsible for pushing Austria to full scale war and blowing the whole thing up. It wasn't the Kaiser, even though the Kaiser clearly was an overall charge. Von Bolke. In fact, I got to tell you a very quick story. So, when I was in the Bobbies in London, the Bobbies of police, we had to jump into the Thames. The problem, okay, I made that part of You just jump into a lake. Isn't this kind of funny? And the other thing is, too, it's got to be cold. That's all I got. All right. So in 1914, to so that August, on August 1st, remember, this, the German plan was mobilize attack France. Through what country? Uh, Belgium. Yes. Uh, they don't want to say they could have called the right to the land that's nice. They are. But what? Uh, I know what you said. You're trying to be cute. Now begin like that. Okay. All right. Now. With that, though, the thing is, in fact, that's your comment for today. But 1914, August 1st, and so the German ambassador to want to England, he met with the English foreign minister, the British foreign minister, Lord Grey, and he walked out of there. He was wrong, totally misinterpreted the talk. But he came out of there thinking that Britain would never enter a war between uh, Germany and Russia. But if Germany attacked France, Britain will enter. And so sent back, we don't, if we don't attack France, we don't have to worry about Britain, we could not rush out. He sent a telegram back to the Kaiser, well, to the foreign ministry, the Kaiser got this overjoyed. All we have to do is turn the armies around, just turn them around, attack Russia, no world war. And he was thinking this could go into, an, who knows if Britain enters it, that with a huge fleet. So he went to General von Mulkey, and von Mulkey you know, spent his whole life now organizing this, planning this. His uncle was one of the great heroes of the Prussian and German military. And so he went in with a telegraph and threw it on the Kaiser, just ran in, threw it on von Mulkey's desk and said, turn the armies around. All we have to do is fight Russia. We don't want to fight Britain and France. Just turn it around. France will stay out of the war. We're fine. And von Mulkey literally started to shake. Like, Look at this. No. Sire, no. It is too late. I can't turn the armies around. And the Kaiser looked at him. And the Kaiser was supposed to be the head of state. The Kaiser looked at him and said, Your uncle would have given me a different answer. Walked out. Now, oh, I should have Bob Mulkey went into convulsions to Sergeant Mark. He had a total nervous breakdown, and within a month and a half, he got to be Let's get to the key element of this. Remember that mobilization? The army took over. The head of state could not stop it. At least he didn't, he could, they, couldn't, they couldn't imagine a way out of this. The army took over, it's too late. That's what I was talking about, those mobilization, mobilization parts. Once they stopped it, they couldn't stop it. Now, as it turned out, France was committed to their hour, but it didn't matter. Remember I told you about those ICBMs? Once they're launched, you can't get them back. You can't turn around. Half hour, it's on. A little bit slower in 1914, it's the same thing. So, back to the Bobbies. So, the Schiefle plan began. So, August 3rd, they just occupied Luxembourg, or Luxembourg. They occupied for the war. And their plan was to sweep through Belgium, and if they resisted, push them away as quickly as possible. But Belgium had built a series of forts along the wide Meuse River, especially at Liège. And we're not talking, don't think, you're not thinking of a wall or something like a castle. No, these are incredibly huge cement forts. Most of them are underground. The walls are between two and three feet thick of cement. The roofs are a foot to two feet thick of cement. They're all still there. I mean, what do you do with it? With a cement port that big, you, may not, you know, you can't just, you have, literally have to blow it up or just leave it. So you can go visit these forts. And Belgium decided to fight. The first German attempt to take them failed, and they needed these forts because those were the main roads. Supply. And so they hit this, and it slowed them up. Belgium made a few mistakes. Um, 
But Germany, though, had showed how warfare had changed. Old cannon would have bounced right off of that. But the new weapons. Oh, I should show you Belgian troops. I almost forgot I had a picture of Belgian troops. Belgium stood and fought for the whole war. They did not surrender. They wore blue uniforms and like little top hats. And they had war dogs. They thought dogs pulling their machine guns and light equipment would be the most efficient way to fight. It turned out to not work at all. Dogs don't like loud sounds and run away. And they're not like horses. They could, they're harder to hobble. It's the poor things. <laughs> Look at these poor dogs. Yeah, we're going for some fun. It's a fun walk. No. So Liege is surrounded. Each of these stars is a fort. And the Germans had to take this city. Liege is a big industrial town in Belgium now, but the forts are also there. And some you can go and walk around in them. They're really kind of creepy and because they're underground, cement, caverns. Kind of scary. They couldn't take them at first. But when Belgium pulled back their main infantry, the Germans were able to move up the new technology, how everything changed. Krupp Steelworks made a 420 millimeter cannon, 16 inches, firing a shell bigger than a car, weight wise. They called it Big Bertha. Poor Bertha. Bertha was, okay, so Charles Krupp was the, uh, um, there's a family business owner of the Steelworks, and his daughter's name was Bertha. So they called it after Bertha. <laughs> so the rest of Bertha's life, she's going to be Big Bertha. But it had to be tall, over 100 horses to move it. Three parts. They had to make a cement platform to fire off of. They started using this and other big guns they got from Austria. And slowly but surely began to whittle away at these forts. These are some of the pock holes and the these are the shell holes. That just slowly but surely. Now, they didn't destroy the forts, but damage the damage. But the big thing was each shell, the men inside, would just, it would shake them, rattle them, and they slowly but surely, they just took the same. Battering them, battering of the forest, and then one by one, each fort would be taken. It shows up technology had totally changed the entire face of the war, and therefore politics, how countries decide things, and those who could have things like Big Bertha. Now, by Big Bertha didn't have enough range to be much of effect later on in the war. But it just showed how things has changed. Heck, by 19 or by 1918, the Germans had a gun called the Paris gun that had a range of 80 miles, a cannon. That's kind of amazing. Not very accurate, but they just would lob shells at Paris just to do it. Total war. And so once the age fell, one by one the forts fell, but the Germans were losing time. Remember, they had to defeat the Russians and then fight. As quickly as possible, fight the, um, I'm sorry, defeat the French and then fight the Russians. And so inside Belgium, a couple things. First off, they plan to control the Belgian population. Basically, threaten instant replies of greedy world like that. Belgium had, Belgium had a militia where every man was in the militia, they'd take their rifle home. The idea they could come right to go fight. And the Germans were convinced they would form a guerrilla army. It turned out to not really happen, but their plan was we don't want, they did not want to keep a lot of troops in every single town because they needed them at the front. So they made it very clear any act of terrorism will be an instant reprisal. Yes. Reprisal means some kind of an attack on Belgian civilians. And so basically, what they would do is they would start literally in every town, they would come in, the Germans would and take a list of all the prominent citizens, depending on their point of view. But it would be you know, civic leaders, um, kind of the educated elite and the, and the wealthier people. And they start taking the name and put the list of names down. And they said, if there's a guerrilla attack on any German soldiers, we start going down this list and shooting each other. Soon they would turn into hostages. They would just take people and hold them. You attack, we kill them. Those hostages, by the end of 1914, were turned into slave labor. Because what they would do in the occupied areas, Belgium, but also in various areas of France, Luxembourg, and going into Russia, they would take. They started kidnapping them, taking them as hostages, and shipping them back to Germany as slave laborers. 
but now they're hostages. So the idea being, yeah, sure. You can, if you want to fight back with Germans in Belgium, fine. We have these people in Germany and we can shoot them right now. And they would do it. I should add, does anybody know what age they would? A little bit older, so 15 to about 22. So you would all be gone. And so the idea of being telling their parents and everyone else we have complaints. But they're old enough to work. Pretty horrific. And so as Germans marched through, they were terrified, especially the second line troops, the reserves following up, that there's going to be like pot shots taken out of. Here's an amazing little video clip, well, film, but this is pre video. Uh, German soldiers marching through Belgium and then cavalry going through Belgium, going through Brussels, actually. And it's just pretty amazing. I mean, these are pretty rare. Those helmets are mostly ornamental. And then look at the cavalry. They still have lances, like it's they're fighting in at Waterloo. Um, I, I think that's just, that's really cool footage. Cameras were big, massive things, so it was really hard to set up quickly. So this kind of thing was rare still. Yeah, well, the film, since they didn't have a, a good battery pack, they would have to turn it themselves to be jerky. And so they could go through the trial. They just would basically, they, when they started to adapt the base of the video, which is not going to the speed of the party. There are techniques now where they can take this and clean it up. And so it starts looking more realistic. This is not one of those. And so, so for example, the town of Denon, Denon on the Meuse River, important um, bridge town on the Meuse, reinforcing German soldiers came and they were convinced. We don't know today what happened. Still unclear. But somebody fired a shot. It might have been Germans panicking, or somebody really did take a pot shot at the German soldiers. But they just freaked out. And they started shooting into homes randomly, just freaking out. Could it be anybody. They just all oh, their enemies all over just started shooting. And then more than anything else to calm down their own soldiers, but shows you the idea of this tear. They ordered every single adult male they could find to be lined up, and they shot them. Over 200 people would be shot right on the Meuse River. They just grabbed so adult looking male. So let's put it all of us males would be shot. You know, because you're, you're close enough. I'm way, I'm old enough. And so this German did do terrorist acts, did do this, would be exaggerated into the Allied propaganda of poor little Belgium. And the propaganda was in cheap. Just ingenious. So here is a French reenactment of the murder at Denon. And you notice these are, this is a photograph. So it looks like it could be real. Now they didn't say it wasn't real, but it did happen. But then they exaggerated. Here, will you stand for this into captivity? Here are Belgian civilians and they make sure that they're women. This is being sent back to Germany. Here is a British propaganda poster. Remember Belgium, volunteer. The United States would be used in this imagery about poor little Belgium when they entered in 1917. So here's the cell, liberty loan to bonds. So buy bonds to loan money to the government to fight the war, they call them liberty loans. And here, halt the Hun or the German. Here's the German committing atrocities and the imagery is Belgium. You see her and her kid, you can let your imagination run exaggerated bias. They took bits of reality and they turned that into convincing people of a certain point of view. And if you're not sure what propaganda is, I wrote the convenient table for propaganda. It's biased information to get a certain point of view. And if you didn't have that immediately, let's write that down. We'll make sure you get propaganda. I've mentioned it once before, let's make sure we got it. Biased information to get a particular point of view. They want you to re look at those things and they want you to feel something. What do they want you to think about Germany? How do they no, Mark, not think? How do they want you to feel about Germany after looking?
Yeah, not just angry, evil. They're evil, but angry too. They're evil and we must kill them. They're subhuman. They're Huns. That's propaganda. Propaganda is it flawed. Not completely, but by definition, it's misleading because it's not telling you the whole story. It's exaggerated too. So it's greatly exaggerated. And how would you know if you were sitting in Helena, Montana in 1917? And no, is this a real thing? Are, will you know? And the thing is, even if you're not sure, if you get bombarded with it for long enough, eventually it becomes, well, you know, okay, that's ingrained. And this is propaganda. It's still the same thing today. And with new media, you know, every time media, truth, technology, and media change. You are bombarded with propaganda all the time, constantly. And the best type of propaganda is when you don't know a lot. What? You don't know the news. Yeah, you just think it's news. And so it's really hard to tell. I have no easy answer. I'll tell you one thing that will not help you to, um, figure out propaganda. Incompetence. If you don't know stuff, not everything, but you don't know or not willing to learn. Yeah, it's it's really they take advantage of people who don't know. Even if they're people of good will, that's not the point. Take advantage of not knowing. So I wish I had another easy answer that doesn't apply knowledge. I should add, you know, as we go through this class for the year, have you noticed how much easier it is to remember stuff? Things start fitting together. That's why it's important. See, I'm doing my propaganda right now. Moving on. So they swept through Belgium. They had a tiny little army. So here's Germany attacking with three and a half million men, or three million men, and the British had 100,000 men. France is attacking here. They don't even realize the threat coming this way. A few German soldiers come here and they try to stop the British or the Germans at the Mons. They're just overwhelmed. And the British just began to go, oh, they're getting the heck out of it. It was a disaster for the British. It looked like it was over because the French did do their attack. Plan 17, the second week of, of August, it's called the Battle of the Frontiers. And to say it was a disaster is not strong enough. French soldiers, you see them with their, with their navy blue and red pants. So they didn't adopt the dull colors that everybody uh, rationally thought about it. They really thought a charge, bayonet charge, see those soldiers with the bayonet? A glint of steel, and that would overwhelm technology. That would overwhelm machine guns. That would overwhelm high explosives. And the poor French soldiers charged in fixed German positions. They took a few, but they're going to lose almost, almost a million casualties. That's killed, wounded, and missing. So that's over 100,000 dead. Missing is usually taken prisoner. The poor French soldiers. It's kind of shocking. I should add, this is, I just, I'm going to tell you how in awe of I am. Here is a uniform, and they realize red's a really bad color. So they went to just this, then light blue, light blue, and then light blue and kind of khaki pants. They still had light blue till the end of the war. The poor French soldiers. They won the war despite their uniforms. They look good though. Oh, that is color film. They had color film in World War I. It was a technique, we're not even sure how they did it today. It was really expensive. So they took these pictures, but they're so expensive to develop, they just kind of went away. And a new technique was developed in the 1930s, and that old way was forgotten. So fortunately, we have a few of these pictures left. There's some great color photos from World War I. There's a lot of color photos from World War II, but it's just really expensive to develop. And, oh, I just want to show you the uniforms. You see everyone else, except for the French, adopted lighter colors. This is kind of a, it's bluish gray. They thought that'd be good camouflage. There's the Americans. Yay. Okay. So 
remember the plan was sweep through here and it looked like it was working. The French attack was a disaster. And even though they were slowed up by the Belgian force, they're behind schedule. They're not moving. Sweep around Paris. The Russians didn't cooperate. They were supposed to attack in about six weeks. But the Russians put everything they had to get over a million troops to the frontier, and they attacked before they were ready. A fourth, a fifth to a fourth of the Russian soldiers didn't, didn't even have a rifle. The average Russian soldier had five bullets apiece. In a bolt action rifle with a clip, how fast can you fire five bullets? So to get the, they're totally unprepared, but they attacked. They attacked into Austria and they attacked into East Prussia. Two big columns and totally panicked the Germans. The Germans just freaked out. They took 300,000 troops from the big wave and started sending them back here. They totally freaked out. But before those troops ever got there, the Germans organized and counterattack at the Battle of Tannenberg. It's a very confusing battle. The German, the Russians attacked into two big columns. And as they were here, they ignored this one, swept around the flank, cut off the, the Russian attack that was ill-equipped. They had bad communications, the men were untrained. And we can't go into details of this, but the Russians were routed. One of the biggest and most decisive military victories in history, and arguably one of the most important battles of the 20th century, and therefore through today. Imagine a few of you heard of Tannenberg, maybe a couple, you might remember from the map. Well, here are Russian soldiers surrendering. Remember, the Germans thought they would defeat the Russians like eight, maybe nine weeks into the war. They had this huge victory here. We did the other wing a long way, but it was Tannenberg. We won. Those troops that were supposed to come reinforced, they're still on trains with the battles fought. They were outnumbered. They were outnumbered two to one, and they still won. An incredible victory. So with that, here are German soldiers marching through France. They're exhausted, but they're still going ready to fight that big battle against the French. But don't forget, they're all thinking, oh, things are different. And von Mulkey's kind of losing. Here are French soldiers on the assault. Here are British soldiers retreating. It looks like it's over. And I have to tell you this, because we're coming up to a series of events that is going to lead to the United States in World War I, which will totally change everything we know about our country. This is a big deal, and it's so amazing. We're not even in it yet. We're neutral. We're just reading the papers. So we're coming to the second most important battle, the seven and a half day Battle of the Marne. And this battle was going to be about the same place that Schlieffen said the decisive battle against the French were. Well, the French, after the disaster here, they're pulling everybody they have to defend Paris. And it's, it's chaos. The Germans are, or the British are running away. Their tiny armies are leaving. And it looks bad. But Germans pull troops back because of Tannenberg. They don't have enough men to sweep around Paris. So instead, they sweep inside to the east of Paris, opening their flank to a counterattack. It's called the left turn in uh, World War I history. They made the left turn. They didn't sweep around Paris. They ran out of men. There were too many gaps. And there was a huge traffic jam. Almost half of the German soldiers were still stuck behind marching through Belgium or fighting stiff Belgian resistance. I think you see the problem, don't you? So the French counterattack. And the French were able to persuade the British commander to turn and join it. The British commander's their name was... You do not need to know this, but I have to tell you his name. It was Field Marshal Sir John French. Yes, that was his name. So French agreed to help the French. Ha ha, that joke. Was... All right. The battle will be fought here. Over a million men would fight in this battle. The plan was 
to cut off the Germans. Actually, the counterattack failed. The Germans didn't, they did not break. But this is what we got to get down. The Germans realized their advance had failed. The Schwedland plan had failed. They weren't beat at the Battle of Marne, at the actual battle, but they knew the Schwedland plan had failed. Von Mulkey would soon be fired, replaced by General by the name of Falcon. And they would this turned the tide of the war. And so in the long term, a strategic, a huge victory for the French. So the Germans pulled back to this line right here. They went to the high ground and did want it. Yeah. What did they do? Yeah, by all rights, Germany should have tried to figure out a way out of this war. The Schiefland plan had failed, but they didn't. Germany made the decision right there, even though they retreated. They retreated to this green line right here to hold. Why? This is the next part we have to get. They'll put an arrow. Tannenberg. They wanted Tannenberg and decided to stay in the war. By every rational measurement, they should have quit. They stayed in. The French and the British should have tried to sue for peace. I mean, the French plan had failed, the British just about left. But the French and the British stayed in the fight. Why? The Marne. The Marne convinced them they could knock the Germans out. Tannenberg convinced the Germans we could win the war. So Tannenberg kept the Germans in the war, the Marne kept them. If that, if anybody thinking rational, they should have ended this thing right now. It's gone to insanity. And yet they stayed. And millions more will die. It's kind of shocking if you think about it. But this might also shock you. Yeah, I'm going to grab your desk. I'm going to tell you something. People sometimes aren't rational. They do things impulsively for pride or honor. And nobody wanted to admit they made a mistake. Gee, I wonder if that's happening now. Hmm. Yeah, you can see it with Russia and Ukraine. So, it's amazing how that happens. The next part would be one of the bloodiest parts of the whole war. It's called the Race to the Sea. So both armies are here. And so they tried to outflank each other, going north. But they could not flank each other, and eventually they ran into the sea. And then what did they do all along that line? Dug trenches all the way, stale. The race to the sea. So, I, it's, uh, this would be almost the line that the United States will enter. And it's, it's, they've learned real fast. You're dead if you're out in the open. You're dead. And so they basically lived in their own graves. And this is going to be an awful part. So we're not going to get to this. I'm going to show, oh yeah. So that's where we start getting the Entente in powers will start calling themselves the Allies. And Germany and Austria will start calling them, we we'll start referring to them as the Central Powers. And here is our German, one of those, same kind of thing, this is 1915. Little caricatures. So this is German. So showing the Germans standing up and showing the French like a toy soldier. Here, uh, um, there's Big Bertha. Here's the Russian attack and see the hand being cut off. That's Tannenberg. Here are the Austrians fighting back. Actually, Russia took a big part of Austria right here, which is now Ukraine, and kept, that's why, well, yeah, we, we can't quit, we can't let the French down. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a video clip. It's, there's a great series called The Great War in the Making of the 20th Century. It's made in the mid-90s, and BBC and PBS made it. One of the best series on World War One. It just it's too too much in, in depth for this class. But I'm going to show you a little bit of going to stalemate because 
I like it so much and it does a great job. This one. What's the big killer? Look at this thing. That's not what that's training the that silliness that we're talking. Not when they're shelling. Horses, men. And we're talking the big industrial Okay? Guys, study. That's it, we're done too. Rain storms continually drench. There's a dead cow close by with her feet in towards the sky, and she gives off a terrible stench. Underneath, in the place of a floor, there's a mass of wet mud and some straw. But with shells dropping there, there's no place to compare with my little wet home in the trench. But the brutality of war could not be laughed away. The German soldier, Franz Blumenfeld, wrote home of the strain of living in a trench. Dear mother, your wishing you could provide me with a bulletproof vest is very sweet of you. But, strange to say, I have no fear, none at all of bullets and shells, but only of this great spiritual loneliness. I am afraid of losing my faith in human nature, in myself, in all that is good in the world. How is it possible that it gives me more pain to bear my own loneliness than to witness the suffering of so many others? What is escaping all the bullets and shells? If my soul is injured, France. So, in this war and every other war after, officers will read the. A few yards away, the British and French were enduring the same hardships. To stay alive, soldiers conspired to limit the killing. It was called live and let live. Command made it clear that a certain number of shells had to go over every day in order to uh, make life miserable for the enemy. But OK, you sent them over at that time of day when the enemy would not be having dinner. You wouldn't fire it at a position where you were likely to hurt many of the enemy. 
you actually hadn't done the enemy a lot of damage, but then he hadn't done you a lot of damage, and therefore you would live to fight another day. Dear mother, I have now got so used to the life here that I am extremely sorry that I wrote you such a miserable letter at first. We neither shoot nor are shot at much. Our occupations consist chiefly in sleeping, eating, playing chess, writing letters and reading the paper. When someone makes music on a harmonica and the others softly or loudly hum the same tune, really, it can be astonishingly snug. You see, it is quite a pleasant life. Franz. Live and let live did not save the life of Franz Blumenfeld. He was killed 11 days before Christmas. One of a million soldiers who died on the Western Front in 19... The same number died in the Russian front, too. That's just 1914. On Christmas Eve, 1914, temperatures drop below freezing on the Western Front. That is in some places, it began snowing, obscuring the moon. Then all across the German lines, lights began to appear. At first, the British thought the Germans were preparing to attack. But instead of rifle fire, sounds of singing drifted across land. The Germans would be heard singing Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht. And the British would respond with a, a British Christmas cowl. In some places, uh, food was lobbed over into the opposing trenches. In one or two instances, the Germans erected Christmas trees. And there was a kind of mutual curiosity, um, certainly instances of soldiers applauding each other's singing. The curiosity led to something never again repeated on the battlefield. In one or two places on Christmas Day itself, the first curious, slightly headstrong people, perhaps, from heads, poked their head above the trenches and being made aware that somebody over the, the other side wasn't going to shoot it off, then clambered cautiously out. One of the first to take part was Captain Charles. Bye, we'll see ya. Stockwell. I ran out into the trench and found that the Saxons were shouting, don't shoot, we don't want to fight today. We will send you some beer. A German officer appeared and walked out. I think they differed, but a lot of the same. What was that last? I just have the short idea, like three more, uh, the short answer question. I saw. All right, I'll let you the beginner classes. All right. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Wait, hey, well, Saturday. No, you're right. Oh, wait, I thought we do. It's 4 a.m. Pat. 4 a.m., yeah. See you Monday. <laughs> 